wound up doing is we wound up going to using a very simple prosthetic on his jawline. And in that case, then I had to go develop a look for him that would still give him that kind of plasticized look, but which would be flexible enough so that it wouldn't crack on his face. So through many, many tests, we finally found a configuration that we could actually use foam latex prosthetics in conjunction with a, a layering technique, which I developed to create this plasticized look on his face. So I think it was very successful. His hair it was also something that we wanted to make. We're thinking, well, if they can develop this robot, then they definitely are going to be able to give him human-looking hair. So we tested with wigs, and we found that we didn't like the look of that. So what I wound up doing was, after his hair was styled, um, I made a stencil that would go all around his hairline. And what I did was I airbrushed within his own hairline to make it look like perhaps underneath where they put the hair in, they had like a form that they, they sprayed on so they knew where to put the hair in. Kind of like, a, almost like a doll. Done. That's all, folks. This is an extremely ambitious, busy, busy movie that is a completely artificial world that had to be designed and created and shot. This is without a doubt the most ambitious movie I have ever worked on in my career. To create an artificial being has been the dream of man since the birth of science. You're a machine. I'm a boy. My name is David. None of us love our electric toothbrushes, but if you carved a face into it that every morning talked to you and knew you well enough to be able to sense your mood, and depending on your mood in the morning would make you feel better, would, would, would make you, make, make, make you just, just set you off on the right foot, would whisper in your ear, would sing you a song, and suddenly that electric toothbrush, if the dog chewed it up, would not be a happy evening when you came home from work or from school and found your electric toothbrush with, that used to challenge you and counsel you in the morning chewed up by the dog. So it's what we project into mechanisms, into machines that's important. It's not so much that the machine can love us, it's how much love do we invest back into it in return. And that determines, you know, you know whether, how far we should go in creating things that remind us of ourselves. I think that we have to be very careful about how we as a species use our genius because we are an amazing species, the human race. And every year we create things that two years before would have appeared like magic to most people. And suddenly it's a reality. And a few years later, it's commonplace in our homes, like the internet. Um, and I, I just think that we all have to be careful a, I have to be careful to preach about this, number one. But number two, that we all have to be careful as we continue to, you know, to quantumly leap ahead into, into the future that we create for ourselves, you know, to take responsibility for the things that we put on this planet. And also take responsibility for the things that we take off the planet. It's a moral question, isn't it? The oldest one of all. But in the beginning, didn't God create Adam to love him? In a sense, you know, uh, we need to have limiters on how far we allow ourselves to go, ethical, moral, and, um, you know, limiters that uh, will say, hey, you know, this isn't for us to, to mess with. A, a bit of that theme was touched upon, as you know, in Jurassic Park. And, and a, lot more, a lot more of it was touched upon by Stanley Kubrick uh, through AI. Stanley investigated several things. He actually built a complete mechanical child that was a complete disaster. The mechanics of what we can do today cannot simulate the liquid movements of, let's say, computer graphic animation. But CGI also has not yet reached a state of the art where it can replicate a human being. We mixed it a bit in Jurassic Park where the animals were CGI and the people, of course, were not. Uh, and Shrek is all CGI, and that's, that's an art form unto itself. 
But to put a digital boy in amongst a cast of human beings photographed on 35 millimeter, we're still years away from that technologically. Stanley knew that, and I certainly appreciated that, so it was really time to cast an actor to play a machine. And Haley Joe Osmond was my first and last choice. The first time we had a meeting, he only mentioned the title. He, the first time we met, he hadn't finished the script. We just met and had a, just a conversation, you know, about travels and Europe and everything. You know, it was just casual. And the second time, after he'd finished the script, we uh, met actually in this room, I think. And um, he talked about the script. And, uh, you know, after reading it, you know, that was it. Immediately wanted to do it, you know, getting to work with Steven on a script, which was fantastic. And uh, after that, we got everything worked out and we were on the project. We talked with Steven a lot about to what extent would we make him robotic. He's so real, but he's not. No, he's not. We actually progressed the character through the film so that by the end of the film, he's, he's basically human. You know, inside he's a robot, but his, his actions and everything are human. He develops throughout the story. <laughs> everything that he experiences makes him less robotic and less mechanical. So at the beginning of the story, it's not like dun, 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 dun. It's uh, it was just very simple. We wanted to make the actions very simple and not practical or um, human like any like if you were like in a chair, you'd like sit down, and David always have perfect posture, and he could sit there for several hours or more. And another thing which was really hard was I didn't blink once in this film. And that was a really interesting effect. Not even when he gets to the end and he starts acting really human, there's there's no blinking. And so that that was a little tough to do. David, the most wonderful thing in the whole world has happened. We shot the first part of the movie in continuity, in the house it was all in continuity, but then of course when we got to shooting all the action sequences and the flesh and everything, we, we had to get out of it. You have to move, can you move around behind him like that? Good, like that. We actually did the underwater stuff first, and that was fun. I got to learn how to scuba dive on this film, because we had a lot of parts where I'm, where I'm underwater. And we had to do, uh, like, scenes where I'm sort of sinking and had to learn to hold my breath for long periods of time and then get on a regulator while I'm sinking because I have lots of weights on. There are a lot of different things I had to learn before I could do this film. It turned out to be a really cool experience because we got to do all these great things in just one film. <laughs> Are you? First thing that would happen, you know, getting there is makeup that got down to where we could make uh, get the makeup on in half an hour. And the whole day, you know, you had to be careful on what you do with your face and your hands because it had this um, sort of this wax on it that if it was damaged, you would see the skin beneath and it wouldn't look as plastic and shiny as it's supposed to be. So we had to be careful with that. I had school on the set three hours a day. Um, studies, you know, we're, we're, they're setting up for a shot or doing a shot that I'm not in. I'd go to school and study, and then when they need me, I go back and I work, and, and that's fun to do, you know, working and doing school at the same time. Hey. Dad and I, every night before we go to work, the next day we prepare for the scene. We're always ready before we go there. Dad, he's been acting for a long time. You know, he helps me get into the character and uh, understand everything that's going on, the subtext, and, and, and what, how the storyline incorporates into each scene. And that makes me give a better performance than I, that I could, you know, all, all on my own, you know, with so much help from Stephen and Dad and, and myself. And the collaboration really made the role better than I ever could myself. Okay. Thank you. And roll it. Haley is an amazing actor. I mean, he's one of those actors, at least from my perspective, that you're in the middle of a scene with him and, and you're watching him and you're going, God, that's, that's really amazing. Oh, uh, oh, you know, you just, I dropped out. A few times I just dropped out just looking at him. He's able to play this phenomenally difficult role of a robot that doesn't have emotions yet, is programmed to have emotions. Yet. I mean, it's, I, you know, I don't know how he does it. And not too long of a pause after she told you about this. Yeah. You figured out this fantastic kind of logic to his character. So you did feel in some ways that you were playing 
against something that wasn't real, which is really interesting. I mean, especially for such a young kid to pull that off. And all will be right with the world because you held my hand and saved my brain. I just approached him like an actor that I was going to work with, you know, and that was it. And what was great was I had great fun because, because he is 12, he likes the same things that I like. Here we are, centre stage. I've always been a great fan of comics and cartoons and kids' films, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a lover of them, I guess. I'm searching for the child in me, or I am just a very kind of infantile <laughs> grown-up, I don't know, but um, working with Hayley was just, for me, from day one, like working with any other actor I've worked with. It really felt like a buddy movie because, you know, June and I got to be really good friends while we're shooting and doing all the fun stuff, you know, the action stuff together and all the cool technical things we got to do. I am. I was. AI has a little bit of Pinocchio in it, and Teddy is the Germany cricket to David's Pinocchio, you know. <laughs> Obviously, toys will get a lot better in the future, and little kids, like, imagine that their, their toys are alive, and here you have a toy that's actually moving and alive, reacting and everything. A lot of uh, intricate work going on with him, and that just makes him so alive. I mean, you just completely forget that he's a puppet. He's very heavy, too. A lot of scenes I'm carrying him around, uh, you know, running away from everything a lot. And, you know, you have to carry this 20, 30-pound bear everywhere because he's got a lot of machinery inside him. Let's not walk this way. Working with Stan's fun. We had a lot of work with him going on in the months before shooting. We had a lot of pre-production things to do, getting live casts of my entire body, my feet, my hands, my chest, and my head and everything. The face cast was probably the weirdest because they put all this stuff on your face and the only thing that's that's open to the air is your nostrils so that you can breathe. And I saw pictures of myself while I was under it and it just looks like a mummy because like they put this whole cast and this glop all over your face and everything. And that was fun to do. They use the cast to make other me's, you know, dummies and everything. They match me completely. And when you have one of them in like a pose, you know, frozen it actually looks like the real me and it's pretty creepy. But the work with Stan is fun, you know, especially the table scene. We had the, the trick table for the part where they opened me up for the surgery. That made the movie more fun. It added another part to the movie. You made a mess of yourself. It's a futuristic movie, but we wanted to make it as close to home as possible. We didn't want to go into all the, the high-tech gadgets and everything, but we wanted to have the advancement of the future, of course, in the movie, but, but we also wanted to have the heart of the film in it to, and to, to still have it come to life for the audience and have it be as real as possible for them. All right. OK. Good morning, buddy. And Stephen was great at, at making that real for everyone. Once again, my customers may ask for me by name, Gigolo Joe, what do you know? There was some evidence from Stan Lee's AI archives about Gigolo Joe, but not a lot of substance. And, and I was like an archaeologist going through every piece of paper trying to find out what did Stan Lee intend, what was the story he wanted to tell, because my job was to honor his story without forgetting about myself. I wanted to also be able to include my own sensibilities. But um, Gigolo Joe was an invention of Stanley's, but he never really fleshed him out, so to speak, or mecked him out. So I had to invent a lot of Gigolo Joe's uh, character, and one of the things I wanted him to be was a dancer. i just take his hand. Like he's a throwback to those old Gigolos from the 1930s, you know, with tails, tuxedo and tails. Uh, he had everything but a cane and a top hat. I, I just envisioned him being elegant, and that was one of the things that attracted Jude Law, I think, to the part. You deserved much better in your life. You deserve me. I first heard about AI actually just after the time that Stanley Kubrick's death was announced. And like many people, I was a huge Kubrick fan. I 
heard about this project that he had apparently been working on. I'd heard of the involvement of Steven Spielberg in, in that project. And I'm taking those in and then it's like... Mm. But it, it kind of came into my life when I was in Berlin working and coming to the end of a shoot there and I just got a phone call one evening. It was my agent who said, look, there's a very, very important phone call you've got to take. Uh, Steven Spielberg wants to speak to you about his new project. He's just decided what he's going to do. Phone goes, I speak to Steven. He explained to me that he had just finished writing the screenplay for AI, that there was a part in it he wanted me to play. I flew to London that weekend to meet with him, and I sat with him and read through it, and um, I jumped on board very eagerly. Yes, that's better. That's much better. Funny much enough, better. That. Rather than that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think the joy of playing a mecha was that every day, for, for me as an actor, was a discovery. It was almost like I was inventing. I, I came to this point several times through the rehearsal process and then through the shooting process, which was, you know, the obvious question, how do you play a robot? What do you think about? I was. How can you possibly set up a list of rules to live by or to act by? Well, in a way, every day and every moment created a new question. OK, how does my robot, how does my mechanical apply itself to this question or to this problem? Do you want me to swirl before we leave? Before we I don't think so. I wouldn't swirl David here. So I worked very closely for three months prior to starting filming with a British choreographer called Francesca Jane. The initial idea was Fred Astaire, just because of his grace. So I worked quite closely with her initially on very kind of classical ballroom type dancing and movement. And that moved very quickly onto movement that was slightly more influenced by Gene Kelly. But having said that, we also came up constantly with ideas that Joe should, if he could dance in one style, why can't he dance in another? And that was affected in sorts by the makeup which started months and months before we started shooting, I think maybe at least four or five months before we started shooting, and was a long process involving uh, Stan Winston, Stephen, and V. Neil. And initially, I think the idea was to create a fake me with prosthetic moulds that were applied, covering my whole head with a wig that looked like my hair, but started to limit to a degree what I could do with my face. So they kind of opted for the alternative, which was rather than make a false me, it was to make me false. So V and Stan brilliantly came up with this makeup that would enable me to use my face naturally, but equally took away the kind of human kind of qualities of my looks. During that process, we flirted with the idea that Joe should be able to adapt his looks and his movement to attract any type of person that he chose. They hate us, you know. The humans, they'll stop at nothing. It was just a joy also to play someone who had, whilst he had such a huge journey, also had a very simple journey. It was a very pure journey. It was a journey of really recognising trust and really recognising that a friendship is more important than a function. You know, Joe's function is to fulfil his chip's needs. It's to keep going out and entertaining customers. But when it comes down to it, he chooses David over that, and that's why you must stay here with me. And that, for a robot, is a huge leap. Talk about a giant step for robot kind. It's actually breaking the function that you have been inbuilt, and it's almost as great as, you know, a slave suddenly realising that he shouldn't be smashing rocks with his hammer, he should be smashing his manacles. It's like, it's a really powerful step. And the shot after this is, as they bring you out, I'm going to get a shot over here like this. I was just pleased to be a part of this gift that Stephen is so good at offering his audiences and serving the part of Joe, really. OK, great. End of Gigolo Joe. End of Gigolo Joe. See you. Or is it? Stanley Kubrick happened to see my very first graphic novel. And he got his assistant to get in touch with me. And it was as simple as that. I'd never done any film work before. And it was some kind of inspiration on his part to actually choose me to actually come and work on AI. 
and when we met, he told me nothing about AI at all. We, we actually just chatted about movies for a good while, about what we liked and didn't like and whatever. And I kind of asked him, well, what do you actually want me to do on this movie? And he said, well, pretty much anything that you want to do on this movie as far as developing the look of it. Um, again, that, it was as simple as that. We did not discuss AI at all on the first meeting. I didn't read the script until something like five months later and actually found out what it was all about. It was a basic overview of what the film was about. I was there as like a conduit, which was just to generate material from that original outline and just present this to Stanley. He would look at it and say yes or no, right direction, wrong direction, and just keep, to be honest, churning this stuff out so that he could begin to visualise what he'd put down on paper. Stephen just wanted me to carry on with what I was doing with Stanley, really, and obviously crystallise it for the, the project and actually take all this material that had been generated and actually start to shape it into something that is going to be turned into a movie. And Rick can almost generate from my sketches. It gave him a lot of free reign, and they've improved quite a bit on my initial designs. Um, early on in the process uh, of developing this movie, Stephen talked to me about this idea that Stanley Kubrick had told him about that related to the movie, actually one part of it, which is the idea of uh, mode jerking. So it's the idea that you go from one mode to another mode to another mode, and that was supposed to be a, a kind of a, an entertainment in Rouge City when they got there, which is what this set is here. And I realized that this whole movie is like mode jerking. Once David starts on his journey, it just goes from one incredible place to another to another. And so I think one of the big leaps that it takes is into uh, Rue City. There's Mildred. I have to show you inside Mildred. It's just this extravagant place of sex and debauchery. Well, to, to start from the very beginning here, in fact, one of the reasons Stephen wanted to make the movie was an illustration that Chris Baker did of the entrance to Rouge City, which is where the, the, uh, the bridge takes it right through the mouths into this city. And then Chris had done a number of wonderful sketches of types of buildings that might be in a place like Rouge City. So what I did was I took those and said, well, if I was in Rouge City, where would those buildings be? What would be the layout that could actually allow us to see those types of views? And then we added to that other buildings, other things, other views, and then from there it collaged into a geographical space that we could actually understand that the boulevard was out here, and this was the way it looked in terms of the color illustrations that we did. And then with ILM, they would actually put that into their computer and make a model. We only have one half of the boulevard, for instance. And then off that boulevard is this place here that we designed to go into this stage. Now we're in the virtual Rue City set, which is the blue screen set where ILM is going to uh, create the, the um, boulevard that will be seen in the movie, which is all these huge architectural shapes that um, make up uh, the big part of Rouge City. They put all these uh, targets up top here so that you can actually tell where you are in the space. So right now I'm in Rouge City and in fact there's a 360 degree environment around me, but you won't see that until you see